Hello, everyone. I'm Vaganos Perzas, and today I will be presenting our work that, along with Panagiotis Leodaridis, Marielena Kasapaki, and Panos Kostantopoulos from Athens University of Economics and Business, we have created that is entitled, indeed, A Knowledge Graph for Humanities Research. So let's take a moment to consider the following questions. Say we're doing our research and we want to find out which papers address a given task or how was the task being tackled or who has worked on a particular topic and what do we know about their work or how was a particular method being used in a specific field, which objects were fulfilled with its use, etc. Now, in order to answer such questions today, one can use as tools large digital research infrastructures that aggregate research objects, tools, and services, but they do so in a way that the actual research context, the way these things appear in the research articles, I mean, is not captured and is not associated. Of course, we can use the good old search engines like uh, Google Scholar or Semantic Scholar, etc. But these engines address the problem mainly by traversing through author or citation graphs, so they deal with the papers as a whole, and they don't delve inside the information that is encoded in the text, in the actual text, the main text of the paper. And of course, there is not, that's not to say that there are not other knowledge, research knowledge graphs out there, but the thing is that they focus mainly in other disciplines, such as medicine, biology, computer science, and the way they do it is they extract named entities from the text or the abstract of the papers, and then they associate those entities with the entire paper itself. So for example, they associate the extracted methods or research problems or data sets with the papers. And of course, let's not forget about the significant amount of papers that are out there in humanities repositories like JSTOR that are not available in native digital form, and usually they are best case as scanned uh, PDF files, or even worse, in a poor OCR uh, text format. And I'm going to go, I'm going to come back to that uh, in a few slides. So uh, our basic principles in proceeding forward with this and creating such a knowledge graph was first to model papers in a structured form, and uh, we were planning to do so by using a conceptual framework that provides us with concepts and relations that we can use in a unified manner along all the papers. We want to support multidisciplinary humanistic fields and uh, we want to achieve that by uh, having, uh, by using concepts that are of course specific for the scholarly domain but general enough in order to cover and be used and applied in every discipline. We want to be able to capture the semantic context of those entities. So we don't want to just extract methods or research activities, for example, but we want to be able to associate them so that we can uh, be able to, to capture the research activity context of a method, so where the method was used and which kind of research or what kind of uh, objectives were fulfilled during that use. And, of course, in order to achieve that, we need to cover the entire article. So we cannot stay just in the article's metadata, not in the article abstract, because that information is usually in the article's main text. And uh, we want to be able to support the retrieval capabilities and be able to uh, answer uh, semantic queries. And that's why our end result is going to be in the form of a knowledge graph, and for this particular case, in RDF uh, format. So, of course, uh, we also need to be able to cover the data set that I mentioned before that are not uh, available in native digital form. So the conceptual model that we will use in, in our endeavor is called scholarly ontology, and it's a conceptual model that is specifically designed to cover these kind of aspects of scholarly activities. The rationale behind it was to be able to represent knowledge regarding scholarly working practices in a matter that we can answer core questions of the form, who does what, why, where, when, and how. And we're doing so by creating these concepts, these core concepts and relations that you see here on the right, starting with the activity concept, which is uh, for describing all the research events, the actual activities that the researchers participate in, such as, for example, an excavation or a sociological study, etc. And uh, these, uh, the actors, the persons, the researchers that participate in those activities are subclasses of the actor class. They usually have some research goals that are objectives of these activities covered in the goal class. The method class, on the other hand, covers the procedures, the techniques, the, uh, the plans, if you, if you may, 
that describe how uh, an activity was, uh, uh, was conducted. And usually you can find those in text as named entities with their proper name. And of course we have concepts like content item or topic that cover topic, the research, uh, the research interests of the authors. Usually these are the author keywords of the paper. And the content item with subclasses such as the research article itself, where we can uh, uh, store information regarding where all these entities, the activities and the methods, etc., were documented in. So our initial data set, it came from one provider, JSTOR repository. It covered almost 26,000 articles, 25,684 to be exact. Uh, covered 89 subfields of the broader humanities uh, section and uh, came from 653 publishers from a publication period from 2000 to 2021. But there was one big problem. The text was available due to licensing and technical reasons only as a product of OCR. And you can see a sample of that. And this, this is a real sample actually of a, of a page. Uh, this is what we got from Constellate. As you can see, the entire structure of the text is lost uh, we don't have sections, we don't have paragraphs, and uh, since it's a product of OCR, and OCR of the previous decade actually, there are a lot of problems and noise that on top of everything else had to be firstly removed. So in order to proceed with this, we created this pipeline that you can see here on the left, and uh, which follows a modular architecture, uh, starting the first module, the text parsing and segmentation. We use pre-processing rules on article's main text in order to remove the title, the author names and keywords, identify the abstract, remove the references section, since in our case study here, in our project, we don't deal with the references yet. We split it into sentences using the spacey sentence splitter and keep indexes for each sentence, of course, and page at the end of the article in order to preserve the provenance. Then the sentences, uh, are fed as input in the OCR noise removal uh, module in order to be classified either as noisy or as clean that can be read and be comprehensible by reader. So as a noisy sentence here, we consider first OCR artifacts from unrecognized encodings that are merged inside the text, deeming the sentence incomprehensible, or text from legends, tables, or footnotes that again is merged with the actual proper text and again, deems it incomprehensible. And finally, the, the third and worst case, text from two column papers that were merged as a single sentence. So <laughs> you can understand that watching it from a distance looks like proper English, but if you try to read it, then it's gibberish. You cannot understand a thing. <laughs> so the way to approach this was to create a deep learning uh, binary classifier to be able to classify. To the, we treated the problem as text, text classification. So each sentence, was uh, fed as input to the classifier and was classified whether it was noisy or not according to the criteria described before. For that, we created a BERT-based uncase transformer. We used it for vector representation in combination with the binary text class classifier. And we trained both components on the same data set consisting of 10,000 sentences balanced. So 5,000 of those were manually annotated as cleaned and the rest as noisy. And the evaluation results, you can see them here in the table were actually quite good. Uh, as you can see, compared to the uh, baseline that we just used the spacey default cl text classifier, uh, the use of uh, transformer models as expected, especially when you fine tune them on the data set, produces far better results. As you can see in F1 scores reaching almost 96, I would dare to say, uh, percent. Then the clean sentences are fed as input into the entity extraction module, and here our methodology is as follows. First, we tokenize each sentence in the input. Then we perform token-based binary classification, and for that we use three independent deep learning classifiers in order to extract activities, methods, and goals. These are the classes that I described before that we take from the scholarly ontology. Now, uh, we treat uh, those classifiers independently for two reasons. First, because our entities can overlap, so we don't mind, it's not uh, either that or the other. And second, because in the future, if we want to train other classifiers, we can just train them and, uh, and add them on the same pipeline without having to retrain everything. Now, uh, for each classifier consists of a transformer and then an NER component on top. And uh, for each classifier, both components, again, are trained and fine-tuned on the same training set. Now, as far as the training set, 
We produced again another training set of 10,000 clean sentences this time. They came from the abstracts and the main text of the papers. First, we used, for the annotation process, we did manual annotation and we used three annotators, two linguists and one uh, computer scientist, which, who after five trials of uh, eight, in total 800 sentences that came from 350 papers, trying to cover as much as, uh, 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 as many as we could of the disciplines and the uh, publication periods, we reached inter-annotator agreements up to 90% for activities, 96% for goals, and 0.92 for methods. These agreements are quite good, in, to be honest, very, very good, which showed that our, tax, our tasks were, uh, were easy, for, for humans at least, to be able to handle. Now, the, characteristic, the characteristics of the training set you can see on the, uh, on the table below. And uh, you can see, for example, at sentence level, which sentences contained activities, how many sentences contained activities, methods, or goals. At, a span, at span level, where at span we consider the textual span uh, that is recognized and, as an entity, as an activity, or as a goal, or as a method, respectively. And of course, at token level. Now, the evaluation was based on token-based evaluation. Again, uh, we evaluated our three classifiers and we compared those with the baseline that we used, which is the default NER uh, by Spacey. Of course, we trained the NER at the same data set. And uh, we also used BERT based and CASE, and this time we used also the Roberta based uh, transformer models. And of course, uh, all of our transformer models were fine tuned at the same data set along with the training of the binary classifiers. As you can see the results, the best results were achieved by the Roberta-based transformer model for all the entities. And the results, of course, vary according to the difficulty of the task at hand. So starting from the worst case, the activities, which is by far the worst type of entities from the three, uh, we see that we reached up to 81%, 81.72 to be exact, of F1 scores. And the majority of errors occurred when we had uh, textual spans in passive voice, because for us an activity could be either in, uh, in active or passive voice, with verbs in usually in the past form. And uh, in, in cases with passive voice, especially where the agent was missing, it was very difficult to understand whether the activity belongs, is something that was conducted by the author of the paper, uh, such as the researcher, that we, it's the case for us, or someone else. So that's where usually the classifier uh, was getting it wrong. And uh, as far as the method entities, uh, we reached 85.21% for F1 score. Again, the errors here, since the methods are treated as named entities, the errors came when usually we had long, uh, a long name, consisted of a long, of talk, a long token, long tokens, excuse me, or we had adjectives. Uh, on top that were characterizing the name of the entity. This is usually where the classifier get, was getting it wrong, uh, deciding on the boundaries of the entity. And finally, the goals are best case scenario. Here is reaching up to 90.72% F1 score. And that's justified because the, uh, the goals, the textual spans that represent goals in our case are very clearly defined in the terms of lexicosyntactic uh, uh, rules. So they're usually textual spans being followed by uh, verbs like, uh, excuse me, tokens like in order to do something or for doing something. So that it was very easy even for annotators. And of course, uh, it shows here that even the machine learning uh, models were, were able to identify them uh, easier. Finally, uh, after the entity extraction, the, uh, the sentences are fed into the relation extraction module where we use post-processing rules in order to extract entities. We deal with two types of entities here, those that associate the activities with methods, the employee's entity, uh, the employee's relation, and uh, those that associate the activities with goals, we call them has objective. Uh, for those, we use uh, rules, as I said, that exploit the proximity of entities' manifestations in text. And uh, to be more specific, for activities, for the employee's relation, when two uh, spans overlap, we automatically create this rule. And uh, for activities and goals, this rule cannot be created, but we use a, 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 a more elastic rule that when the spans are in the same sentence, a uh, has objective relation can be created. As you can see in the evaluation, which was based on a thousand sentences for each uh, entity type, for each relation type, excuse me, you can see we reach high, quite high numbers, and this justifies is justified because of the uh, the type the the, uh, the nature of the of these types of relations, 
that allows us to use the sentence as the, the, the major environment in order to be able to proceed with this kind of uh, classification. Finally, uh, the annotated entities and relations are, uh, uh, are in inserted as input in the URI generation uh, module. And uh, here we, uh, we have two types of entities, those that are extracted from metadata, and for those we, use we create the URIs based on the namespace, the entity type, and the entity ID that we come from the, comes from the metadata of the paper. And the entities that are extracted from text, and from those we employ the NIF data model, and we use a combination of namespace, entity type, source, and character boundary offsets from the text that we extracted the entities. Uh, we support also RDF, RDFS, OL, SQOS, and NIF data models, and we also provide ORCID integration with the authors of the paper when, of course, it's possible. As an example of uh, an RDF triple that is produced by this procedure for an activity, you can see it here in the picture. And finally, as a visual recapitulation of the entire pro process that I mentioned before, Starting from these kind of sentences, like here, we use random forests on the extracted lyrics in order to perform linguistic analysis. First, we identify the textual chunks that at hand. We proceed with extracting the entities that I mentioned, activities, methods, and goals. Then we extract relations based on these post-processing rules that I mentioned. We add that to the metadata that we extract from the paper, so we, asso we associate the activities with the authors of the paper, which are the researchers that participated in those activities, the article itself that it was used to document everything, methods or goals, the author keywords that function here as the topics, uh, the um, affiliations of the authors that are the organizations, etc. And then, of course, we add it to the existing knowledge in order to create the knowledge graph, and once we do that, we can explore various semantic paths in order to find information, for example, here for an author, what kind of uh, their interests that they have, the articles that they have written, the research activities that they have participated in, or the objectives that ha they have tackled, the methods that they have used. Or in other cases, we can retrieve information regarding methods, for example, what kind of articles they have uh, mentioned them, or what kind of activities uh, have employed them, what objectives were tackled during this employment, etc. So, it, to conclude, I just present two indicative queries that could be used to show, uh, hoping to show the use of such knowledge graphs. Here, for example, we can retrieve all methods employed in activities with objectives that deal with linguistic analysis, so we can filter out all the objectives that in their label they have the word linguistic analysis and do, do this kind of uh, answer to the query. Or in a more uh, complex manner, here you can see, for example, a paper, let's call it paper one, can be an entire paper, can be recomposed in terms of the activities that are conducted by the authors inside the paper, along with their objectives and the methods that they have employed. That would be all for my part. Thank you very much.